Hey everyone, it's Ethan. Trace is out this week, but we have some great sponsors for this episode, and I'm filling in to give them some love. Today's show is supported by another show you might enjoy, IRL by Mozilla. On IRL, host Veronica Belmont shares real stories of life online and helps you make sense of the way technology is changing your life. It's an entertaining look at the good, the bad, the trends, and the impacts of this new modern world on us humans. Subscribe to IRL today, wherever you get your podcasts. We're also supported by the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, who would like to remind you to avoid drunk driving and driving while drug impaired. If you feel different, you drive different. Learn more at nhtsa.gov. Drive high, get a DUI. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Secret Plus again. This week, I've still got Dr. Mike from the National Laboratory on the International Space Station, or CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. So make sure you stick around, subscribe for all the episodes in this series. We're gonna continue the conversation we started last week about the International Space Station and experiments that are happening up there. So what technologies have we actually seen come out of these experiments that we have on the International Space Station? So uh, you mentioned things like microgravity and drugs, but I'm thinking more like, I know we, we made a video a while back about like cordless batteries and things like that. So things, something that maybe one of our viewers might get their hands on. Would, is there anything that you can think of? Yeah, there's some devices that are coming out. We There's been a lot of interest I mentioned in looking at the space environment as a harsh environment in which to live and work. And, one of the things you, you have to pay heed to when you're working in that environment is the elevated radiation in that mm. environment. And that has an influence upon electronics, especially electronics that are used in computing systems. So actually one of the, the developers of uh, imaging capabilities on board the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, one of the drivers in designing that particular instrument were the ability to collect large amounts of data and condense it down so that it could be translated back to Earth because uh, you could fill up the data channels very quickly with that. So a company was engaged to, to build hardened computer systems that would operate in, in that space environment. And the approach they took was to actually look at building systems that were easy, cheap, and easily replaceable. And some of that technology is now translated back to Earth in that we sometimes no longer have to build these hardened computer systems that are going to operate in the space environment or at the, the bottoms of the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean. You have the ability to utilize these systems which have parallel processing capability and other things. So it's driven the way that these hardened systems are designed and, and kind of where they've used. We've seen similar approaches in, in microfluidic devices. So uh, we tend to throw out terms all the time about microfluidics and nanofluidics and no one really knows what it means. Yeah, I was gonna ask. <laughs> at the heart, it comes down to just really tiny channels. Uh, in order to, to deliver drugs. So one of the things you have to worry about in a, in a microgravity environment are keeping gases and liquids separated. Uh, here on Earth with gravity, the heavier stuff, the liquids are gonna settle down to the bottom and the gases are gonna float up to the top, like when you open a, um, a bottled water with gas in it, you're gonna see the, the gas kind of come out the top. That doesn't happen in the microgravity environment. And one way you can get around that is by designing very thin capillaries, very thin channels for the fluids to go through. Or you can use centrifugation, you can spin the gas out of liquids that way. So it's a thing that as an engineer you try to design around. But for folks who are trying to design ways to deliver drugs uh, on target, for example, cancer therapies, having that ability to deliver things in very small amounts in very defined quantities is an advantage. Mm. So we've had several companies that range from large pharmaceutical companies to small startups that are two or three folks deep, look at the space environment and that absence of gravity for ways to take their microfluidic devices and fly them in the space environment so they can do the math and understand the fluid physics of the way fluids are flowing through those devices and the way they're delivering drugs on target. Uh, very recently we flew an experiment, actually a series of experiments from an investigator at Houston Methodist Research Hospital who started off two, a little over two and a half years ago with an idea about a microfluidic device for drug delivery that was going to be used for a variety of different cancer therapies. And at that stage the first experiment was simply looking at the math to understand the way the device was going to be able to deliver a fluid uh, at a certain level. In the next round of experiments, he was actually able to test the device. And in the most recently completed 
series of experiments, they actually had the device implanted on mice, mm. and they were delivering a drug on time to the mice. So over the course of two and a half years, he was able to take his design from concept and modeling all the way through to a translational test where he was actually looking at it. And that particular device has significant potential value for here on earth because if you're a diabetic and your sugar levels are fluctuating all, all the time, you need to have the drug delivered at a constant dose over time when it's, at, when it's most needed and mm -hmm. not delivered when it isn't needed. And this device has the, the ability to do that. Hmm. We've uh, also seen companies that are looking at glucose monitors for diabetes. They're interested in understanding ways to understand uh, fluid levels of glucose in your blood without having to do a finger prick and, and mm -hmm. take that out. Um, yeah. On the material side, things that have translated back, we have experiments that are going up very soon, haven't flown yet. We have uh, Goodyear on board the International Space Station, and they're looking at the infusion of silica into rubber material. Uh, and that can lead to, to advances in rolling resistance on tires. So, mm, so they last they, longer. They'll last longer and they will, you'll use less fuel on the tires as you go through. We have experiments that are going up on the station very soon from Delta Fawcett. We were talking about at the ISS RDC conference this week. Delta Fawcett is um, required by law now to conserve water in, in several states where they in place shower heads. And, they're always looking for ways to make the customer feel like they're getting the same level of water, the same pressure of water, when they're actually getting less water delivered over time. And one of the neat things, again, about that absence of, of gravity in that environment is they can do modeling of droplet formation in that environment mm -hmm. and understand ways to improve a, a shower chip that they now have, which promises to deliver the same fill as a normal shower, but use significantly less water. Today's show is sponsored by WGU, an online university that's changing higher education. Its innovative competency-based learning model was designed specifically to fit in the lives of busy adults. WGU is nonprofit and surprisingly affordable, offering bachelor's and master's degrees in business, IT, and healthcare. WGU works with industry experts to make sure their degrees are current and relevant, so you'll get the skills and credentials that employers are seeking. Many industry certifications are included in their IT degree programs at no extra cost. And if you already have the certifications, they transfer so you can finish faster. It's also about half the cost of most other online universities. So get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash seeker. That's wgu.edu slash seeker to learn more and get your $65 application fee waived. wgu.edu slash seeker. Water conservation is a major issue for us now. Uh, we're currently working very hard to uh, provide access to the International Space Station as a remote sensing platform for water sustainability issues. Uh, it's not a, an ISS national lab asset, it's a, a, a sensor array that's been developed by Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but there's a sensor on board the International Space Station now called EcoStress. So EcoStress is taking advantage of the orbital inclination, the, the height at which uh, the International Space Station flies above Earth, to image water use and water conservation around the Earth. And it has an advantage over other satellites in that the International Space Station orbits the Earth about every 90 minutes, and it revisits the same spot on Earth about every three days, mm -hmm. but not at the same point in, in the day. So you're able to look at the same uh, specific geographical location on Earth under different lighting conditions. And that can be very beneficial if you're looking at agricultural crops, water usage, coastal erosion, other issues like that. And we very recently worked with Target Corporation to, to uh, uh, work with their folks who are interested in social uh, responsibility issues. Uh, as a major retailer and seller of clothing, Target has identified cotton as a, an area of uh, concern for them where they're looking to make more sustainable crop production of, of cotton. Mm. It takes over 700 gallons of water to make a single cotton t-shirt. So it's obviously uh, uh, a large consumer yeah. uh, of water. And so they're Casus sponsored with Target to develop a cotton sustainability challenge that was funded by Target Corporation to use the International Space Station National Laboratory to look at solutions to help with that sustainability of cotton as a plant. And one of the um, 
projects that was awarded, three, three different groups were awarded for that particular investigation. One of them is looking at the use of data from EcoStress and other sensors that can be delivered to the farmer in the field. So farmers will get real data from space that they could use in combination with data from field sensors that they could use in combination with data from drones to understand when is the optimum time to water or mm -hmm. do they not need to water on this particular day. Hmm. Um, and that those real world solutions are going to be coming down in, in less than a year yeah. from the International Space Station. So we see, you know, lots of technologies and advances like that where companies and, and consortia of groups get together and have real world problems that they're trying to solve by utilizing the space environment. And some of those are, are coming back to Earth as we speak. What about uh, like students? Do students get to send things up to the International Space Station? Like if, uh, you know, some students wanted to watch this or listen to this and then send an experiment up, is that something you guys do or? We absolutely do. We partner with uh, Boeing Corporation on Genes in Space, uh, mm -hmm. and many PCR is, is heavily involved in that as well. The Genes in Space program is, uh, there's a competition going on uh, where the winners will be announced tomorrow at the International Space Station Research and Development Conference, where high school teams can propose experiments to utilize a, a small polymerase chain reaction device on board station. So, uh, student scientists can propose experiments where they're going to be amplifying nucleic acids on board the International Space Station and getting real data back down. And it's an opportunity for student teams to not only propose science and essentially expand upon the, the, the science experience that they have in high school, but they're getting real world data. Yeah. We've had winners from the past that have looked at uh, effects of radiation in the crew members' blood. We've had experiments that have looked at, uh, proposed looking at the microbiome on mm -hmm. board the International Space Station. We talked about test organisms a little bit in that environment. And a lot of times we take, we take organisms up with us that we didn't intend to. Sure. Uh, that live on <laughs> us and in us and around us. And uh, polymerase chain reaction is a good way of looking at that. So yeah, we have a genes in space is just one of those programs. We have a variety of, of opportunities for uh, ISS National Lab uh, students to have access to the space environment and many of our partners also have uh, student-led programs and opportunities to apply for grants cool. to work on the International Space Station. Uh, I guess one more question for this uh, for this week and that is um, you mentioned water a lot in this episode and it got me thinking about water on the space station. How does water get do they, do they bring it up and then continually recycle it? How does, I mean, it's a closed environment, really. So how, how does water work on the ISS? Yeah, that, that's a, a very good question. So um, a gallon of water weighs over eight pounds. So it's, uh, it's something that we have to have, but it's difficult to get into the space environment because it weighs a lot and you, you require it in order to get through your day. So most of the water that was supplied when the station was first uh, began assembly was provided from Earth. It was launched on space vehicles and, and birthed up. They uh, have built a, an environmental control and life support system, which the, in the engineering community they like to call the ECLIS system. And the ECLIS system has everything that's required for air revitalization, for recovering the air, removing the CO2 and resupplying oxygen to providing water. So currently on board the International Space Station, they have a system called the Water Recovery System. They're very imaginative engineers. <laughs> and it actually recovers uh, water from urine mm -hmm. and from humidity condensate. So humidity condensate is a fancy way of saying what we excel and uh, exhale uh, with every breath. So that system is able to operate at about 90% efficiency now. So they are able to recover 90% of the water that comes back into the water recovery system from urine and humidity condensate. So at first blush, some people may think, well, that's kind of gross because I'm drinking, drinking yesterday's urine, yeah. urine today, but it's really no different than the process we have here on Earth with a couple of exceptions. It's done much more quickly on the International Space Station and that the water molecules are recycled a little bit more, uh, more quickly. And we don't use a lot of biology in that system on board the International Space Station. Here on Earth, most of our water recovery like that involves a sewage treatment plant at some point in the step. And that's where our, our friends, the bacteria and, and some fungi in some cases are doing good things for us and recovering that waste. On space, 
there's concerns about having too many microbes in the system and keeping them where you want them and, and out of places that you don't want them. So the water recovery system relies more upon engineered systems, physical chemical systems to do it. But So there's still some water resupply that goes up to fill that 10% gap, but most of the water that's used on station now is recovered. That's super cool. Thanks for watching the show. And one more reminder from the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, do not get behind the wheel if you are drunk or stoned. You're not only putting yourself in danger, but everyone around you. And yes, that includes marijuana. Reaction time slows way down when you're high. Check out one of our older videos entitled Pot Does This to Your Brain to learn more. If you feel different, you drive different. Learn more at nhtsa.gov. Drive high, get a DUI. And thanks again for our sponsor, WGU. That's an online university that's affordable, innovative, and changing lives by changing higher education. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash secret. We'll have more with Dr. Mike next Thursday, so make sure you all subscribe and you come back next time. And thank you so much for watching Seeker Plus.